Hello. Welcome back to my Sleepy Time Reading channel. Today we're moving on with How It's Made by Archibald Williams. And today's chapter is How Matches Are Made. The cheap and ubiquitous match measures Bryant and May's factory. Square wood matches. Making the heading composition. Reeling the splints. Dipping, unreeling, boxing. Round wood vestas. A wonderful machine. How it works. Making cardboard boxes. Wax vestas. Making the taper. Cutting it up. Heading wax vestas. A huge output. A few centuries ago, if you had produced a little piece of wood and, by rubbing it lightly against a little box, had caused the end to ignite suddenly, you might have run some risk of being yourself set on fire as a professor of the black art. If, however, you could have persuaded people to view the matter differently, and you had possessed a few dozen gross of boxes, a large fortune would have been at your command. Today the man is poor indeed who cannot afford a box of the useful little fire sticks that are among the cheapest of the cheap things which we buy. For two pence halfpenny you get twelve boxes. Each box contains about fifty matches, so that two hundred and forty matches a penny is the rate. For matches to be so cheap, their manufacture must be conducted very economically. You cannot imagine even a Chinese workman being able to split and dip separate matches and sell them profitably at their present price. He could not possibly compete with the machine of the white man who strews matches so plentifully wherever he goes. In this chapter, I want to tell you of the famous works of Messrs. Bryant and May at Bow in the East End of London. These works are all the more interesting because there you may see the most modern methods in operation, side by side, with methods which, though extremely ingenious, they are gradually supplanting. Under the kindly guidance of one of the directors, I was shown how three different types of matches are made. One, the square wood match, two, the round wood match, and three, the round wax match, or Vesta, all three of which you use yourself. The first process I saw was the mixing of the igniting composition used for heading the matches in large mills, through which it is passed twice. Then we entered a room where machinery whirred and workpeople were busy preparing square wood splints for dipping. These splints, by the by, all come ready-made from Canada, where whole forests are converted into matchwood by very clever cutting machinery. The Square Match If I were to let you have many tries, I wonder whether you would guess correctly how these splints are arranged quickly in groups in such a manner that no two splints may touch when ready for dipping. Well, this is how it is done. A long canvas belt, passing under a hopper full of splints four inches long, is wound onto a revolving reel. The splints fall onto the belt, one after the other in quick succession, are spaced out and drawn in between the layers of the belt, which, when fully wound, makes a coil about 18 inches in diameter, containing 4,000 splints. The splints, being an inch or so longer than the belt is wide, their ends project like a multitude of bristles on either side of the coil. From the winding machine, the coils go to the beater, a circular press which levels the ends of the splints. Then they are drawn over hot iron plates to heat and dry the ends, which are subsequently immersed in a bath of liquid paraffin wax. This substance renders the wood near the heads very inflammable. Down a lift travel the paraffin to splints to the dipping room. The heading composition is spread out on steam-heated slabs by a horizontal knife or gauge working in a frame. The dipper moves this knife across his slab, scraping aside all the stuff except a layer of exactly the right depth, takes a coil, dips one side into the composition, hands it to a boy to hang up to dry, ready for dipping on the other side, scrapes again, dips the next coil, and so on all through his working day, by the end of which he will have put the heads on some fourteen million matches. The coils of matches are placed in rooms in which warm air is kept in circulation, by means of revolving fans, and as soon as the heads of both ends are dry, the coils pass to the unrolling department. The belt is unwound, and as the matches fly out, they are caught in trays 
and given to deft-handed women, who sees exactly the right number to fill a box, cut them in half in a guillotine and press them into their box. The actions are repeated so fast that one can hardly watch the nimble fingers. The full boxes are done up in packets, the packets in cases, and the matches are ready for the public. All this is very wonderful, but there are better things to come in the round match department. Making Wood Vestas The first thing one sees on entering this department is a maze of big drums slowly revolving. Looking closer, you notice that the drums are arranged in sets. One set to a machine about 63 feet long, 2 feet wide, and 15 feet high. Further, that over these drums travels a continuous chain of metal plates, with myriads of matches projecting from one side of it. At one end of the machine, a girl is feeding long blocks of pine wood into two guides, at the bottom of which is a traveling belt. This carries them forward into the grip of two fluted rollers, which present the ends obliquely to a row of 48 cutters. Each cutter is a small steel bar of rectangular section with an almost circular projection at one end through which is drilled a hole of the size of the match. The metal round the hole is very thin and sharpened at the lower edge. Down come the cutters through the wood. When they reach the end of their stroke, a plate studded with little steel pegs rises under the cutters, keeps them company during the upstroke, and then helps to push the splints out of them into a row of holes in the traveling chain, which is halted for a moment. The holes in the chain being a trifle smaller than the holes in the cutter, the grip at the chain end is tighter than at the cutter end, and all the splints are withdrawn from the cutters. This operation is repeated 260 times a minute for 10 hours, so that the machine turns out about 7 millions of matches a day, allowing for stoppages and broken sticks. Let us watch the progress of the splint after it enters the chain. As it passes slowly forwards, the lower end is drawn through a bath of melted paraffin wax kept at a constant level by a little automatic bucket that ladles wax in from a reservoir beneath, into which the surplus constantly overflows. After emerging, the splint travels a little way through the air to allow the wax to set, and next encounters a roller turning in a bath of igniting composition. The roller picks up a layer of the proper thickness for the head, and, since its circumference moves at the same rate as the belt, the match is not dragged through the composition, but is gradually submerged and drawn out. The effect is the same as a vertical dip and gives a perfect pear-shaped head. The matches are now complete and have only to be dried by traveling over a large number of the drums already mentioned. At the end of an hour or so, they have returned to the head of the machine, where they are ejected from the belt by a row of punches and automatically thrust into the trays of boxes which have been moved underneath by a traveling belt. This belt ejects the trays filled with matches onto a circular revolving table. Girls seize the trays, thrust each into a cover, and drop the now-completed boxes onto the table. Another girl slides them down a chute to the packers, who snatch up twelve boxes at a time and pack them up in a printed wrapper, and then twelve packets into a larger parcel to make a gross of boxes. The grosses are consigned to wooden cases, and the business is complete. Messrs. Bryant and May are now introducing a machine for making square matches by the same process. In the same room is a wonderful machine forming box covers. The cover is the outside or case of the box, out of a long ribbon of cardboard. The mechanism scores the strip longitudinally in four places, where the bends will come, glues one edge, doubles it so as to form a continuous rectangular tube, prints any required design on the top and bottom, glues one side, and sprinkles it with ground glass to make the striking face, and chops the tube up into covers, which are delivered at the rate of about 800 per minute. Another machine makes the trays. You'll see part of a cardboard strip, the center portion of which represents the material used in one tray. At each end is part of an adjacent tray. Sharp wheels score the cardboard lengthways and across the dotted lines. Up comes an arm with 12 projections on it, each loaded with glue, and makes a dozen patches on the card. These patches are equally distributed between the ends of the two neighboring trays, so that two dabs are required for each tray. 
Next, the pieces are stamped out to give room for bending, and the strip is severed down the line of cut. Each piece is brought under a die, which bends the ends at right angles to the sides, and turns the sides up square to the bottom. Then the ends are raised and pressed tightly against the others, to which the glue makes them adhere. The complete tray is forced into a metal former fixed to a band, in which it travels for one revolution of the band that the glue may set. Finally, a punch presses the tray out of its former, and it slides down a chute into a large basket. But we must pass on to the wax vestas. Take a vesta, knock off the head, wrap it up in a bit of blotting paper, and hold it near the fire. The wax melts and is absorbed by the paper, leaving a number of bare cotton strands. In a vesta that I have just treated thus, there are twenty-one of these strands, each composed of many cotton threads twisted together. In one part of the factory stand a number of bales of cotton yarn. My guide rips open the canvas case of one of these, and reveals what appears at first sight to be a tangled mass. After a little search, an end is found, and the tangle resolves itself into a rope of threads. This rope is one and a half miles long, and the strands are divided up into fifty groups, by passing through holes in a flannel end piece. When the cotton has to be coated to form a taper for matches, the bale is removed to the dipping room. Operatives attach the extremities of two ropes to a huge drum, or reel, at one end of the chamber, and wind on the ropes, which, as they pay out, are grouped by the end piece referred to. When all is on, the free ends of the groups are passed through the interstices of what may be called a very small fence, standing on the edge of a tank, under a roller which nearly touches the bottom through one hundred holes in a steel die on the other side, and away to another big reel. The tank is filled with a mixture of glue and steering, kept liquid by steam circulating in a jacket enclosing the tank. Reel number two is revolved by an engine, and gradually robs reel number one of its one hundred groups of threads, each of which receives a coating of steering. The steel dry scrapes off all superfluous wax as the now taper passes through. This process is repeated several times, the reels being alternately wound and unwound, and the die shifted from one side of the roller to the other. The temperature of the steering bath is lowered between every two windings, and at last we have 150 miles of beautifully smooth cylindrical taper on one reel. This is transferred to the matchmaking room, where it is cut up into the required lengths, dipped and dried and being now converted into wax vestas, packed in boxes, by a machine very similar to that which makes round wood vestas, the points of difference being that a row of lancets replaces the steel cutters, and that the chain grips each wax stem after it has been cut off from the reel by means of a tiny spring, so as not to injure the substance. A single reel of taper cuts up into about nine and a half million wax vestas, one inch long. The total output of the factory is some 1,300 million matches a week. This is an enormous number, but yet it would not suffice to allow the inhabitants of the globe a single match all round per week. So Messrs. Bryant and May find plenty of work for another large factory in Liverpool, although there are other very productive firms in the kingdom, to say nothing of huge factories in foreign countries. We may notice at some length the making of fusees. The machinery for carrying away fumes, dusts, and chips from the workshops by induced draft, the ingenious lathes which peel a continuous thin wafer off a revolving log for box making. But there are other manufacturers demanding their share of our space, and we must move on. And that's the end of the chapter about how matches are made. So, you were probably wondering, as I was, what wax vestas actually are. Vesta was the Roman goddess of the hearth, and wax vestas were named after the goddess when they were invented because they were mainly used for lighting fireplaces and stoves. They were a kind of match that burned slower than a piece of wood because they were made, um, as, as the description said, like a tiny little candle. So they were made as long strings, which the chapter was describing. So they were made as a long string that was dunked a bunch of times in wax to make a really thin candle and then cut into pieces, and each of the pieces was tipped with a phosphorus head. 
This made it so that you could light the match by striking it, but then instead of burning quickly like a little piece of wood, the wax would burn more slowly, and you could use it to light the fire. Interestingly enough, when I was looking at the history of matches, so when I was looking at the history of matches trying to figure out what Vestas were, I came across some other interesting little factoids, like the fact that matches were extremely unstable, and there were instances where if somebody had a, a box of matches in a cart, the cart going over a bump could cause the heads of the matches to rub against each other enough that the whole box of matches would burst into flames. Another problem with phosphorus matches was that you could have a box of matches on a shelf, and if the sun hit it right and stayed on it long enough, it could heat it up enough that, again, the box would just spontaneously burst into flames. So you had to be careful with matches, a lot more so than you do now. You had to be careful so that they didn't catch fire or light themselves when you didn't want them to. Uh, another little interesting fact about early matches is that the phosphorus and other chemicals that the heads were made out of that would initially catch fire were pretty strong chemicals, and there would be warnings that people with weak lungs or any kind of um, breathing problems should avoid them or only use them in well-ventilated places. Well, that pretty much uh, is the extent of my knowledge about matches right now. Thank you again for coming to my channel. Please subscribe if you like it, and leave me a comment or a thumbs up, or both. And I'll be back soon with more how it is made.